Welcome, everyone, to this edition of the Doorstep Podcast. I'm your co-host, Senior Fellow at the Carnegie Council, Nick Vosdev. And I'm Tatiana Serafin, also Senior Fellow here at Carnegie Council. Very excited in a moment to welcome Professor Tarun Kana, the George A. Paolo Lehman Professor at Harvard Business School, and he also runs the Mittal Institute in New Delhi, who will be speaking to us about India. Because I really believe, Nick, that now is India's moment. It's been on my mind a lot. I don't know what you think. Yes or no? Is it India's moment? I think so, too. We've had so many references to India uh, and the rise of India and India's importance to the doorstep from so many of our guests on the doorstep, uh, including when we had uh, the book talk with Admiral Stavridis and Elliot Ackerman. Uh, The book itself revolves not only around India playing a major role in world affairs, Uh, but also the prominence of Indian Americans, including a hypothetical national security advisor and other senior U.S. officials uh, of Indian uh, descent. So I think you're on to something with this. Yeah, for me, um, it's been on my mind for a long time, particularly related to the lack of really good India coverage. Um, So I look at it from a media lens, but also from a doorstep lens, the super doorstep lens of getting a catalog from the American Girl Company, which is exactly what it sounds like, celebrating America. Uh, But their Girl of the Year is an Indian American. And I thought, wow, this catalog is going out to parents and guardians across the country Uh, And here's what they're seeing. And I thought, wow, there is something here that we need to address um, in a bigger format and tie all the threads that we've been hearing together here uh, at the doorstep over the past couple of years. And so uh, now we're going to go and see what Professor Kanat thinks. Thank you so much for joining us today, Professor Kanna. I am so excited to speak with you about something I've been thinking about for a very long time. Um, And then all of a sudden I saw Lydia Polgreen's op-ed in the New York Times where she called this moment, this moment in time for India, the moment that India will be recognized. Uh, And that's been said a decade ago and a decade before that. And, And let's, let's start out with this meta question. Do you think right now is India's moment? Well, first of all, to the op-ed, you know, from uh, from her lips to the ears of God is what I say, because <laughs> as you as you say, we've been here before. Um, look, I think uh, I'm I'm by nature a, a glass half full kind of person, and so I tend to be perhaps overly optimistic. But I do think there are some structural fundamentals that are uh, in India's favor this time around. Uh, foremost among them, I would uh, list something. Uh, that is not in the hands of any uh, political process or administration and it's basic demographic change, right? I mean, a simple-minded, not wholly accurate, but not inaccurate way of saying it would be that uh, we in India are about to go through the next 25 years what China went through in the last 25. Uh, And there's all sorts of scholarship about the extent to which the, the demographic tailwind was the partial or substantial motor behind the super impressive GDP growth that the Chinese economy racked up in decades past. Uh, but I think any sensible reading of the, of the evidence would say that it certainly mattered a great deal. Uh, now, uh, can we mess it up in India? Yes, uh, we can turn the dividend into a democratic albatross, but I think the smart money is against that, um, that there's enough energy uh, that uh, hopefully this would be a nice engine. Um, and secondly, you know, India, like any complicated society in transition, has uh, its bright spots and darker spots. Um, and we can talk about whatever it is that you want to talk about. Uh, but on the bright side, I think we do have an administration that is more of a can-do administration. Um, and uh, the geopolitics is somewhat aligned. Uh, and so at least are not a barrier to progress. Um, so those are a couple of the reasons why I... I'm a bit more optimistic than my usual optimistic self. (laughs) Well, if I can then also, you mentioned geopolitics and perhaps uh, building on that, uh, also the impact of the of the pandemic in calling attention, particularly from the American side, the American doorstep side of the vulnerabilities of having so many supply chains running through China, 
and the sense that, uh, and you're seeing this in the American business community and the American strategic community, that perhaps uh, it's India's uh, turn now to, to really assume uh, the place, uh, particularly with high technology manufacturing, uh, that China more or less by default captured over the last 25 years. Are, are you seeing a sense that not only, as you said, the demographic wins, the geopolitical wins, but also that the business and economic wins uh, are aligning to, to make this the moment in a way that uh, perhaps the past moments didn't quite pan out? Uh, Nick, I would say we are better positioned than we have in the past. We've been in the past uh, for sure. There is a, there's a realization that um, we we meet, when I say we I'm referring to we 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 the Indians um, that we've missed the boat in the past um, and shouldn't let this one slide. Uh, in the past, whenever manufacturing has moved out of uh, China, uh, it must be said that it's tended to favor other countries, uh, Bangladesh, Vietnam, for instance, and uh, more power to those neighbors of ours. They've done unbelievably good work and deserve their success. But I think India needs to take a page out of their book and say, how is it that we can um, uh, get around our uh, historic neglect of hard infrastructure? I think if you divide up, uh, simple-mindedly, I admit, if you simple-mindedly divide it into hard and soft infrastructure as being the basis for private enterprise, I'd give us uh, uh, a thumbs up on the soft infrastructure side, a relative thumbs up, at least for a developing country of our per capita GDP, and uh, uh, thumbs down historically for the hard infrastructure side. But there again, you see a lot of progress. You see you know, uh, uh, better roads and highways, better power, better sanitation, things of that nature that, of course, as you know, are the bedrock of any uh, productive society. I'd like to get more specific a little bit on, uh, on the business side of things, um, especially because I think News-wise, uh, the, the business headlines have been dominated by the uh, Adani Group um, and, uh, you know, the, the short selling there and, and the market and losses, tremendous market losses, and then the talk of the, you know, administration's ties to the group and what that means for the economy going forward. Um, do you think that what's that event it impacts more than just the business news. So what we try to do here is look at how it's tied to the doorstep. So is that even more significant on a global market scale? Um, and, and, and that leads me to the, the bigger question of how integrated in financial markets is the Indian market? Um, and is this something that we really should be looking at uh, more aggressively and, and reporting more on? And Because I don't think there's enough of it. Um, so the, the Adani episode, uh, I don't have first-hand knowledge, but I, uh, do know a great deal about India's, uh, uh, financial market regulators. Uh, there's something called SEBI, the Securities and Exchange Board of India. Um, uh, and it is a first-rate organization, um, very well governed and polices the markets and, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the stock markets themselves, National Stock Exchange, the Bombay Stock Exchange are uh, incredibly liquid. Uh, they don't have the problems of many emerging markets. They don't have the, frankly, the volatility of the Chinese uh, markets either, but they have the depth and sophistication. Um, uh, uh, I wouldn't say they are as sophisticated as the US markets in, in some sectors, for instance, in uh, valuing intangible assets and intellectual property and so on and so forth. But in the main, they are pretty amazing uh, equity markets. Uh, and the debt markets are, uh, if I had to say, are uh, not as good as the equity markets, but are, uh, again, controlling for per capita GDP as a summary metric of development, uh, they're pretty amazing. Uh, so the financial markets are robust and deep and liquid, um, particularly for the better companies and for increasingly for de novo entrepreneurs. So that's all good news. So why am I saying all that in response to the Adani crisis? I don't think the Adani crisis is going to have system-wide ramifications. I do think it'll cause uh, 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 outside investors um, to look anew. You already saw, for instance, uh, you know, who is it this morning? Total, for instance, uh, the French energy company saying, we're well, gonna wait and see. Uh, and I think that's appropriate. They should wait and see. Um, 
onto Mr. Adani and his enterprises issued their own investigative report, and the uh, uh, Indian regulator chimes in if it is appropriate for them to chime in. Um, so, you know, I hope that everybody learns from that episode, and to the extent there's something that needs to be corrected in the Adani group, it gets corrected. But um, I, from what I can see from the outside, there is, a, again, there are lots of problems. Like we can go into the problems. Uh, I have a long list of issues that I would like the regulator to address. But in the main, it is a professionally run uh, uh, equity market or a debt market, a capital market um, uh, with a central bank that um, uh, is also run well and is in the main uh, independent. Uh, so I'm not overly, overly concerned about the Adani episode. Uh, the other part of your question, Tatiana, was should we in the U.S. be covering the markets more? Um, I think that's a no-brainer, honestly. I'm just uh, flummoxed by how little it's covered. Uh, I mean, you know, one of the most amazing things in the Indian story is the digital revolution, uh, the digital public goods revolution that is... Uh, going back to, I don't know, 2008, 2009, when the celebrated entrepreneur uh, Nandan Nilkani, one of the co-founders of Infosys, um, started what's called the Aadhaar Project. Aadhaar in Hindi means foundation, and the idea was to give a digital identity to every individual living, uh, every resident living in India, so that you could have uh, seamless digital highways to every resident of the country. Citizens or non-citizens, so not motivated by security considerations and so on, uh, but really to create the largest biometric database in the world, uh, you know, dwarfing that of the FBI, for instance, or any other one in the world. And that has become the foundation for over, you know, in the um, uh, in the 10 plus years since, the foundation for all manner of digital uh, interventions that frankly have leapfrogged the U.S. Uh, and then some, uh, quite a bit. And you know, when I speak to CEOs in the Harvard classroom or visitors from around the world or my American students and I say, did you know that this is going on in a poor country? I mean, you know, it's pretty much blank stares. Uh, and that's a function of how little informational infrastructure we have between the countries, which has deep historical residues and we can go into it if necessary. But one last comment. Um, back in uh, 1976, uh, Harold Isaacs, a journalist, wrote a lovely book. Uh, called Scratches on My Mind, or something like that. Uh, and the book was a meditation on why the American public is infatuated with China and ignores India. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, here we are, <laughs> essentially, 50 years later, uh, with a version of the same thing. Uh, so, yes, I do think it would be in our American interest to cover the Indian story significantly more, beyond the usual coverage that we give to, uh, you know, poverty and... Uh, uh, slums and uh, such like. It's interesting with you mentioning that because in an earlier doorstep, we had Ambassador Charles Ray, uh, who had served in different uh, in different positions across the African continent. And he, he also sort of referred to what happens when there's a certain narrative that takes over. And he says, with regard to Africa, it's always a narrative of poverty and famine, yes. uh, which crowds out uh, other stories. And it does sound like it's a case here that the you know, the U.S. Uh, media infrastructure has slotted India into into certain boxes, poverty, uh, religion, uh, cultural exotica, uh, but that the day-to-day -day business security uh, ties that you would expect, uh, that certainly which, you know, are part and parcel of the transatlantic relationship, uh, don't get covered as much. And this also with India being... Uh, one of the the leading countries of the Anglosphere. Certainly, many more speakers of English uh, in in India than in the United Kingdom, um, or Canada, or Australia. And yet, uh, we we do seem to see these barriers. And, and as you sort of see this moving forward, right? And you talked a bit about uh, the Adhar project, and we have so much discussion now within the U.S. national security community about digital security digital silk roads, the, 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 the challenge that China poses uh, in expanding its uh, digital networks across Latin America and Europe and Africa. Uh, is that going to be, do you see this? And you said you, you, your students give you sort of the blank stare, 
Are you seeing any change in that regard that, that you're getting less of a blank stare or there's more of a sense that uh, as we move forward, uh, that India and the United States as partners in so many of these areas that this will become the, the, the default assumption in the way that we don't even think about the UK or Germany relationship with the United States. It's just second nature that we expect that. Do you, do you see uh, the India-US relationship evolving in a similar trajectory? I think I do. Um, I don't know if it's gonna be at the same level of the so-called special relationship that the US has with the UK. Um, uh, and you know, I would be surprised if it ever got to that because uh, India has is a sort of you know subcontinent-sized uh, situation, civilization that has plenty of interest in the region and is, uh, um, uh, it, you know, in largely good ways, I think, self-confident enough to uh, march to its own tune. Um, but I do think that relative to the very low informational vacuum uh, that we have currently, uh, there already is enormous progress. Uh, look, it hasn't escaped anybody's notice that uh, as a result of at this point, decades of largely skilled immigration from India to the U.S., uh, including people like me, if I'm allowed to call myself skilled for a moment. Um, but, you know, generations of uh, doctors and engineers and lawyers, CEOs of major tech companies, you know, uh, deans and presidents of universities, uh, financiers, venture capitalists, entrepreneurs, um, uh, vice president of the United States, um, congressmen, that you're starting to see uh, Indian Americans uh, pop up. And th there's a natural bridge that that's gonna create, I think. Uh, and an affinity on the India side also to say, hey, I see that, uh, that guy or that lady there who's in a position of influence. And guess what? He looks like, he or she looks like me. Uh, and that's bound to have an effect uh, on people's mindset. And I think we should just build on that constructively um, and not expect that the countries will always be aligned on every single thing that would be a very, uh, how would I say, like a fake, uh, fake uh, friendship in some sense, um, but have a genuine dialogue. And I think the fundamentals are in place for it. Um, I, I, I wrote the book in 2008 called Billions of Entrepreneurs, which I loved writing. I loved writing it. It was just so much fun. I traveled all over into China, learned to speak the language a bit, traveled all over India, and wrote about you know stories of entrepreneurs, some sort of famous, celebrated people, but also. Uh, whatever the the Putungwa, Mandarin, and the Hindi equivalent is of Joe Schmo. Um, uh, <laughs> school, I just wrote about them, and it was just unbelievably effective. Um, uh, and then just realized that the way I would characterize it is that, um, you know, uh, India is a, is a statistically noisier version of the U.S. That's the way I think about it. Um, or to put it more starkly, since you probably had conversations about China, I think one of the chapters I said that um, uh, China is uh, uh, as an as an as an information construct uh, is noise free but biased. Uh, mm -hmm. and India is noisy but unbiased. Yeah. And what I mean by that is India being noisy but unbiased. There's nobody trying to tell you, uh, trying to distort the truth. But everybody there's a there's a cacophony, and if you sort it out, you'll get the truth. Uh, so it's a noisier version of America in some ways. And in China, you get a clean story. It just may not be the right story. Um, and so it's seductive in that sense. It's noise free, but it may very well be biased in one way or the other in a way that's hard to know ahead of time. And you see that all the time in, you know, statistics reported about COVID deaths, for instance, in approximate sense, um, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so it continues, you know, Harold Isaac's uh, scratches in my mind continues to scratch on my mind and say, what the heck, this guy you know, pointed this out to the American public. And 50 years later, we're still there. So there you go for inertia. So. <laughs> well, I think, you know, to that point, let's let's everybody know, because I, I told this statistic to some of my students and they were uh, very interested to say that today, Indians represent the second largest U.S. immigrant group after Mexicans and ahead of Chinese. Mm -hmm. And we don't talk enough about that, mm -hmm. um, about this culture uh, 
that is, you know, if you look at the graph, um, this great migrationpolicy.org has some great graphs, you know, where where Indian Americans live, you know, California, Texas, actually, but but really the city, the main city is New York City. And certainly we see it here, uh, but it's not a bubble. It's it's not just New York City. Um, it's, it's around the country. Um, as you mentioned, making inroads into the Biden administration. Um, heck, I even heard uh, Trump speak Hindi. So, uh, you know, it's, it's out there. And, and I think who that would have thought? Who who thought? Um, I think we do need to look at the connections and we do need to um, understand, I think, more, um, you know, and I'm really into business as a business journalist, economic and uh, you know, writer, um, looking at the fact that, you know, last year, the World Bank um, revised its GDP growth forecast for India to this year to 6.9%. Uh, Indian economy more resilient to the global shocks we've been feeling. India has replaced Great Britain as the world's fifth biggest economy and is on track to replace Germany as the fourth largest. And that storyline is not told. And, and hopefully, you know, today here at the doorstep, we're telling it and we are recognizing that these interconnections are um, physical, right, bodies here, <laughs> you know, Indian Americans, um, an Indian diaspora that's affecting um, us here, but also these economic connections um, that I think, you know, earlier on you said, you know, American companies um, are taking advantage of. I mean, I think I read that Apple plans to make up to one fourth of its iPhones in India, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's all these interconnections um, that we should be made aware of. And I'm wondering, you know, what do you recommend, you know, to my fellow journalists? To, where do we start to tell these stories? Um, and how do we start to tell them better? Because I think that's part of the problem, too, in journalism. Um, that's that's an interesting question. I haven't had anybody ask me that before. I mean, I, you know, I think that uh, I think that there are uh, lots of credible uh, both uh, Indian institutions, as well as credible American institutions that have footprint, uh, feet on the street uh, in India, um, and have institutional and personal footprints um, that are equally comfortable in both societies. Uh, I'd include myself as a small example in that, but more important than the individuals, the institutional footprints are robust and well. Uh, it should be relatively easy for a bunch of interested parties um, we can start with the three people on this call, on this podcast, and say a bunch of interested parties put together a list and you know publicly make it accessible to say that if you need, uh, heck, I volunteer, I run a big institute for Harvard called the Mittal Institute, which is right in the center of New Delhi in Connaught Place, which is the center of Old Delhi, uh, some of the most beautiful real estate in the country, and uh, you know we we'll help anybody. Uh, we're you know when we don't have. A, uh, an extra grind. We'll just help anybody with the information. And uh, as an academic institution dedicated to just pursuing uh, intellectual inquiry, uh, but just like that, there's so many other uh, entities that are trusted names in the U.S. Um, that uh, that would be that would be willing to be a resource and eager to be a resource uh, for journalists to build uh, uh, understanding like this. You know, one thing that uh, there is an opportunity here, Tatiana and Nick, which is India has the presidency of the G20 um, this year and uh, uh, is sort of predisposed and primed to use the opportunity constructively to tell the India story. Uh, and I think one of the things that journalists could do is um, figure out a way to plug into that, uh, particularly with the more uh, less chest thumping versions of the storytellers and the more substantive versions of the storytellers. Uh, to tell the story about how, you know, health is evolving, how adaptation to climate change is evolving, um, uh, how India is positioning itself vis-a-vis -vis the politics of the region, vis-a-vis -vis China in particular, um, you know, how uh, geopolitics with the Quad and so on, you know, with uh, uh, the U.S., Japan, Australia, and India participating together, how all these things are evolving. So there's a real opportunity under the G20 to tell this. Um, and my good friend Amitabh Kant, who is the uh, the G20 Sherpa, representative of the Indian government, is uh, leading a pretty major uh, push to tell that story uh, globally. Uh, so this is the moment in some sense. 
Um, you mentioned, and I just want to kind of maybe as our last question, because uh, we are coming up to the one year anniversary of the Russia's second invasion of Ukraine, um, and you have leaned into uh, with your comments, India taking a greater role um, as leader of the G20 and the Quad. And, and I think that the U.S. has really been looking at India, too, as a partner um, as a military partner, as as a you know, and I wonder, uh, is that something that you see as an opportunity for India to to stand in the region more as a military power? Is that something that India is comfortable doing? Um, what what is what does India see itself as <laughs> in the region? Look, I think uh, India. Uh, first of all, I'm not an expert in hard power military security, so please take this with a grain of salt. Um, from what I can see, um, India is in a moment of transition. Uh, uh, relations with China have uh, uh, reminded us that we had a tough encounter in 1962 and um, that it's better to be prepared. And uh, of course, relying uh, as the armed forces historically have done on Russian arms is uh, probably unwise. Um, uh, given the state of the Russian economy, frankly, even before uh, before the Ukraine crisis uh, uh, started. And so there's been a move to diversify away uh, towards, for instance, getting aircraft from France. Um, and I think part of the barrier has been U.S. reluctance historically to uh, to send advanced arms. So there, so there's, you know, there's geopolitics, uh, sensible geopolitics, frankly, uh, on all sides and giving and taking, but uh, you know, with the with the quad relationship starting up, I imagine that those restrictions are being re-examined on both sides. So I think India will uh, uh, become more of a credible hard power player in the region slowly, but slowly. Um, uh, and uh, at the same time, you know, I think I would imagine that if I were in a position of influence regarding India's hard power, which I am not, it must be said. Um, I would have to be very careful if you know most of my uh, stock of of, of uh, military equipment is uh, is from from the former Soviet Union and Russia. I imagine there's a spare parts issue and a transition from that that needs to be adroitly adroitly managed. So the good news is that we've got a super smart guy running the Ministry of External Affairs, a good friend, Jay Shankar, mm. uh, who's an established yeah. diplomat. Uh, you know, uh, as I remember, Jay speaks. Uh, in Mandarin and Japanese and has been ambassador to both the U.S. and uh, and China in the past. Um, uh, so, you know, I'm confident that we have the right leadership to help navigate this. Uh, and ultimately, I think it just comes down to trust uh, between countries. Historically, in the so-called Cold War, when India, uh, you know, was one of the co-founders, going back to Nehru's time now, co-founders of the uh, non-aligned movement, and uh, wanted to be very careful to be seen as not overly in any one camp. Uh, there was uh, after, you know, I may get the dates wrong, uh, but in the 50s, there was a lot of sort of uh, 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 Banami and good relations between the US and India, the Green Revolution, et cetera. And then we went into a cold, uh, into a cold diplomatic <laughs> standoff uh, with Russia being uh, uh, closer to India than the US was. I think that era has passed, uh, and I expect that as uh, you know, uh, U.S.-India bonds strengthen as they have been now for a couple of decades, and um, uh, for reasons that we've spoken about already earlier in this podcast, are becoming stronger. I suspect you'll see much more cooperation, even on the hard side uh, and on the soft side, um, and it's good for for everybody. I think so. No, I think it's important, uh, the themes that we've been stressing here, a moment of transition, the need for, for leadership. And as you said also, that as the relationship deepens, it is deepening because more American doorsteps are connecting to Indian doorsteps, uh, whether the, the, the personal relations, family relations, business relations, increasing media relations, security relationships. So uh, I think as you've, as you've laid out for us very much this sense of uh, the trend lines are moving in this direction and accelerating on all of these different vectors. Absolutely. I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that summary comment.
2024, Modi's running again? Seems like it. <laughs> All right. It's going to be a big I year. About my pay grade, but it seems like it. <laughs> it's going to be a big, big year for the U.S., a big year for India, and I see only great things. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. Of course, very sweet of you to invite me. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Tatiana. Be well, and uh, talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to The Doorstep, sponsored by the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs. For more, visit carnegiecouncil.org. Stay healthy and safe.